Hello there, I'm Anita Wu, and you're watching Nightline, the top stories. Government to review touch-and-go monopoly of highway toll collection system. And Johari Ghani, Khalid Nordin, joins One Rosti in Umno VP lineup. We start with our headlining story. The government will review the monopoly that Touch and Go has in the country. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim said there has not been a significant improvement in terms of its services since its inception. Touch and Go has been in operations for the more, more than two decades. Uh, there has not been convincing or uh, development or progress in the system. And I think you are right. We will have to reconsider that. Thank you. Earlier this year, the Domestic Trade and Cost of Living Ministry said that a special task force to look into people's complaints regarding services provided by Touch and Go would be set up soon. The complaints were reportedly related to Touch and Go's visa prepaid cards, difficulties in obtaining Touch and Go cards, Touch and Go RFID problems, as well as unanswered hotlines. It is estimated that there are over 25 million active touch-and-go cards and about 90% of its transactions are for toll payments at 31 highways nationwide. On another matter, Datuk Sri Anwar revealed that the government is looking to amend the existing Universities and University Colleges Act 1971, or AUKU. He said that AUKU was a comprehensive legislation, but part of it must be repealed, adding that he had discussed the matter with Higher Education Minister Datuk Sri Muhammad Khalid Nordin. Saya akan bagi jaminan semua peruntukan yang mengekang kebebasan, bukan saja kebebasan mahasiswa, kebebasan akademik, termasuk pensyarah-pensyarah. Itu akan dihapuskan. The Prime Minister said this at Dialogue Anak Muda Temu Anwar session, attended by more than 5,000 youths during the Youth Empowerment Fair 2023 at the Kuala Lumpur Convention Centre on Sunday. In the nearly two-hour programme conducted by celebrity Amelia Henderson, he answered a myriad of questions in a relaxed and open manner, including on current issues such as job opportunities, health, education, transportation and the economy. Later at night, the Prime Minister said a convention involving parties in the unity government will be held to determine a common direction and course of action in the administration of the country. The convention, among others, was also aimed at framing the same thinking and policy among the parties that make up the unity government. The Secretary will keep the time to keep the time to keep the time to keep the time. He said this in a media conference after chairing the second Unity Government Secretariat meeting at Manara Dato On in Kuala Lumpur on Sunday. Dato Sri Anwar also said that negotiations over seat distributions among the political coalitions aligned with the Unity Government for the upcoming six state elections are proceeding smoothly and will be concluded soon. Among party leaders spotted at the Unity Government Secretariat meeting were AMNO President Datuk Sri Ahmad Zayed Hamidi, Datuk Sri Fadilah Yusuf of Gabungan Parti Sarawak, DAP Secretary General Anthony Lok, as well as Datuk Sri Salahuddin Ayub, who is Amanah Deputy President. Two new faces, Pahang AMNO Liaison Committee Chairman Datuk Sri Wan Ahmad Rosdi Wan Ismail and Federal Territories AMNO Liaison Committee Chairman Datuk Sri Jahuari Abdul Ghani have succeeded in securing their positions in the AMNO Vice Presidential Race. Joining them is Johor AMNO Liaison Committee Chairman Datuk Sri Muhammad Khalid Nordin, who successfully retained his seat as one of the three AMNO Vice Presidents for the 2023-2026 to term. The announcement on the party poll's results was made by AMNO Elections Committee Chairman Tansri Shahri Abdul Samad in a press conference at the party's headquarters in Menara Dato on Kuala Lumpur on Sunday. Bagi jawatan naik presiden um, yang amat berhormat Datuk Sri Haji Wan Rosdi bin Wan Ismail uh, memperolehi 124 iaitu undi yang tertinggi uh, boleh diandaikan Ya, ataupun dirumuskan bahawa uh, Datuk 
Seri Haji Wan Rosdi, Menteri Besar Pahang hari ini, mengambil tempat uh, Datuk Seri Ismail Sabri lah, orang Pahang eh, yang menggantikan uh, orang Pahang juga. Uh, kedua ialah uh, yang berhormat Datuk Seri Muhammad Khalid bin Noden, uh, Ahli Parlimen Kota Tinggi dan juga uh, Menteri Pendidikan Tinggi. Uh, kedudukannya 114 uh, bahagian. Yang ketiga, uh, seorang muka baru ya, yang menjadi uh, uh, Datuk Seri Johari bin Abdul Ghani, di Ahli Parlimen uh, Titi Wangsa ya, dan juga pengurusi kepada um, backbencher ataupun penyokong kerajaan, uh, penyokong kerajaan Madani. Ya. Jadi, uh, kedudukan 107 uh, bahagian. Tan Sri Shahre also said Tan Sri Badruddin Amiruldin has successfully retained the UMNO permanent chairman's post after securing 176 votes, while Datuk Sri Abdul Fattah Abdullah will assume the deputy permanent chairman's post. Meanwhile, those who have secured a seat in the party's Supreme Council are Deputy Home Minister Datuk Sri Shamsul Anwar Nasara, followed by Foreign Minister Datuk Sri Zamri Abdul Kadeh. International Trade and Industry Minister Datuk Sri Tengku Zafrul Abdul Aziz and Deputy Finance Minister Datuk Sri Ahmad Mazlan are also in the lineup with the same number of votes from 167 divisions. The rest and the 25 member Supreme Council include Sabah AMNO Chief Datuk Sri Bung Mokhtar Radin, Kelantan AMNO Liaison Committee Chairman Datuk Ahmad Jazlan Yaakob and AMNO Information Chief Isham Jalil as well as three women leaders, including former Putri Amno Chief Datuk Zaida Zarek Khan, Datuk Shahaniza Shamsuddin and Datuk Rosna Abdul Rashid Sherlin. Tan Sri Shari said that four Amno divisions were not involved in the party polls at the national level. He explained that the Tanah Merah and Kota Kinabalu Amno divisions have been suspended, while the election process for the Buluran and Johor Bahru Amno divisions have been postponed due to technical issues and disputes. Mana 187 keputusan uh, bahagian yang total dari segi jumlah ke semua bahagian yang terlibat dalam proses pemilihan ini. Tan Sri Shahri also said that 54 out of the 187 division chiefs who won the polls are new faces, which show the dynamic changes that are happening in UMNO. He added that party members are given three days from Sunday to submit any objections on the election results and the UMNO election committee will deal with them accordingly. The UMNO elections this time involved over 160,000 delegates and have been ongoing since March 11th. The 2023-2024 to academic session in all schools in Kedah, Kelantan and Trunganu began on Sunday as scheduled. However, the situation was different in some schools in Johor as they were still affected by floods. Johor State Education Director Mat Sayed Mat Damon said five schools with about 2,000 students are still closed following the floods. He stated that SK Mendapat, SK Tanjung Sembrong and SK Sri Nasib Bay in Batu Pahat remain closed as floodwaters have not receded, while SK Pogo and SMK Buloh Kasap in Sagamat, which are experiencing power supply problems, are expected to be operational on Monday. Setelah dua buah sekolah di Sagamat, yang tidak banjir tetapi ada masalah elektrik. Eh. Sekarang kami telah bekerjasama dengan JKR untuk memastikan sekolah itu selamat. Meanwhile, Johor Education, Information and Communications Committee Chairman Norli Zahno said students who are affected by floods in the state have been given a two-month exemption from wearing school uniforms. The exemption was given to lessen the burdens of families affected by floods who need to replace their children's uniforms. A total of 595,454 students in Johor are scheduled to start school in 1,192 schools for the 2023 to 2024 session. Elsewhere in Kedah, a total of 334,426 students from 750 schools started their new school session on Sunday. In Trunganu, the new academic session in 505 schools across the state involved 235,665 students and 22,144 teachers, whereas in Kelantan, 280,942 students started schooling in 595 schools in the state.
For other states and federal territories, the new school year will start on Monday and end on March 10, 2024. Meanwhile, the Education Ministry is in the process of distributing 50,000 laptops to all schools nationwide to facilitate learning using digital textbooks. Its Director General, Datuk Pakarudin Ghazali, said the Ministry was also finding a suitable formula to distribute the supplies so that every school receives them. Kita bergerak ke arah untuk melaksanakan dasar pendidikan digital dalam proses untuk membawa ke peringkat Jemaah Menteri sekiranya diluluskan nanti hala tuju kita ialah ke arah pendidikan bersifat digital supaya anak-anak kita dapat sumber pembelajaran yang lebih menarik mudah difahami dan pada masa sama memberi impak yang besar kepada kefahaman mereka he said this after inspecting the first day of school for the 2023 to 2024 academic session at SJKC Chunghua in Kota Baru, Kelantan on Sunday. Datuk Pakarudin also said the use of digital textbooks needs to be supported by suitable electronic devices, adding that the MOE has produced over 70% of digital textbooks since the initiative was introduced in 2021. He also stressed that internet connection is one of the main points of digital textbook learning that needs to be focused on, adding that the ministry is still trying to ensure that there are enough devices to be supplied at schools. The Agriculture and Food Security Ministry expects the domestic egg production to recover and reach the export level by the end of this year. Its minister, Datuk Sri Mahmat Sabu, said this was due to the government's efforts through various ministries to facilitate labour entry into agriculture as well as other sectors since January. Datuk Sri Mahmat said the domestic egg supply was showing signs of stability and the government planned to stop the import soon to give priority to local producers. He pointed out that his ministry would also continue to pay attention to risks such as climate change as well as diseases that can affect production. On December 16th last year, he stated that the ministry had agreed to temporarily allow the import of eggs to overcome the shortage and will review the decision once the domestic supply stabilizes. Tadutsri Mahmud said this during a gathering with the Malaysian diaspora in Jakarta, Indonesia on Saturday. The event was part of his three-day visit to the Republic from March 17th to explore new technologies as well as approaches used by Indonesia to increase rice production. He also revealed that the ministry aims to increase the national self-sufficiency level from the current 65% to 75% in 2025 and then to 80% in 2030. The Human Resources Ministry is working to resolve the plight of textile stores, barber shops and goldsmiths, which are affected by the government's decision to end the hiring of foreign workers using temporary employment visit passes, PLKS. Its Minister V. Siva Kumar said he had held discussions with Home Minister Datuk Sri Saifuddin Nasution Ismail and Domestic Trade and Cost of Living Minister Datuk Sri Salahuddin Ayub and submitted an appeal on the matter last week. Saya juga telah kemukakan uh, surat permohonan uh, tersebut uh, kepada beliau, surat daripada uh, pihak uh, yang berkepentingan lah, uh, daripada uh, tiga-tiga sektor ini, telah pun saya kemukakan kepada beliau dan uh, saya berharaplah okay, satu pertimbangan akan dibuat dengan segera dan saya percaya uh, satu keputusan yang positif akan, di, akan diberikan sebab uh, jumlah yang, yang terlibat sebenarnya bukanlah jumlah yang besar. Okay, uh, kalau dibandingkan dengan sektor-sektor kritikal yang lain. Siva Kumar said this to reporters after officiating the second International Tamil Classical Music Conference 2023 in Ipoh, Perak on Sunday. He stated that since January, several organizations and business associations had come to him to request the order be withdrawn. The minister was responding to a circular issued by the Immigration Department on February 28th, stating that employers in the three subsectors would no longer be allowed to renew PLKS permits for their employees starting March 15th. It is estimated that these three subsectors require 15,000 foreign workers to ensure the continuity of their business operations.
Donald Trump expects arrest on Tuesday. This and more from the foreign front when we return. Stay tuned. Former U.S. President Donald Trump said he expects to be arrested on Tuesday over an alleged hush money payment to a porn star in 2016 and has urged his supporters to protest as prosecutors gave signs of moving closer to an indictment. Citing a leak from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, Trump called on his supporters to protest ahead of his alleged arrest on his Truth Social platform on Saturday. His lawyer, however, said there had been no communication from law enforcement and the former president's post was based on media reports. A spokesperson for the district attorney's office declined to comment. The investigation centers on a $130,000 US dollar payment that Michael Cohen, Trump's former personal lawyer and fixer, made to porn star Stormy Daniels in the waning days of Trump's 2016 campaign. If indicted, he would be the first former U.S. president to be charged with a crime, marking an explosive and unpredictable development in the 2024 White House race as Trump seeks again to clinch the Republican nomination. So for years, of... Pei Tong Tan Shinawat, daughter of former Thai Premier Thaksin Shinawat, widened her lead as the voters' top choice in the latest opinion poll ahead of a general election tentatively scheduled for May. Pei Tong Tan, who represents the Southeast Asian nation's largest opposition party, Piu Tai, garnered 38.2% of support in a poll of 2,000, while her approval jumped from 34% in the previous poll conducted in December. Pita Lim Jaranrat of the Move Forward Party came second with 15.75% of support. Incumbent Prime Minister Prayut chan o -cha, in the meantime, garnered the backing of 15.65% of respondents, also up from December's 14%, ranking him third. Kuwait's constitutional court ruled that last September's parliamentary election, in which the opposition made gains, was void and that the previous assembly must be reinstated. The court issued a verdict on Sunday, annulling the results of the 2022 National Assembly elections due to discrepancies in the decree dissolving the previous parliament. The move came at a time of renewed friction between the elected parliament and government and followed the reappointment this month of the country's prime minister, whose government had resigned in the standoff with parliament. Last year, Kuwait's crown prince dissolved parliament and called early polls in an effort to end prolonged domestic political feuding that has hindered fiscal reform. Over in Bangladesh, at least 19 people were killed and more than 25 injured on Sunday after a bus smashed through a highway fence and plunged into a roadside ditch in the southern district of Shibchar. Twelve people were critically injured and all of them have been sent to Dhaka Medical College Hospital in the capital. Police said it was suspected that the driver lost control, resulting in the vehicle carrying more than 40 passengers to hit the railing of the newly built Padma River Bridge Expressway falling about nine metres into a roadside ditch. 
Road accidents are frequent in Bangladesh due to old and badly maintained vehicles and roads, as well as poorly trained drivers. So to come on Nightline, Alcaraz, Medvedev and Sabalenka cruise into Indian Wells finals. Don't go away. Back with sports news now, tennis, the 2023 BNP Paribas Open. Top seed Carlos Alcaraz was far from his best, but did enough to beat Italy's Yannick Zina and set up a final showdown with red-hot Russian Daniel Medvedev. In a rematch of the thrilling U.S. Open quarterfinal that the 19-year-old Spaniard won in five hard-hitting sets en route to winning the title, Alcaraz needed to save a set point in the opening frame against Zinna before reasserting his control, taking a 7-6 win. Zinna got the first break for a 2-1 lead in the second set, but Alcaraz bounced back to grab the tightly contested frame 6-3. The world number two will now turn his focus to a showdown with Medvedev, where a victory would return the Spaniard to top spot in the world ranking for the first time since January. Medvedev earlier squandered seven match points before finally getting past Francis Tiafo 7-5, 7-6, to secure place in his first Indian Wells final. The fifth-seeded Medvedev secured the narrow victory after one hour and 47 minutes on court. In the women's event, second-seeded Arina Sabalenka moved into her third final of the season with a 6-2, 6-3 victory over last year's runner-up Maria Sakkari. Sabalenka prevailed in one hour and 23 minutes in the Californian desert, increasing her head-to-head -head lead over seventh-seeded Sakkari to 5-3. The Australian Open champion will face reigning Wimbledon champion Elena Rybakina for the WTA 1000 title on Sunday. Turning to football now, the German Bundesliga. Borussia Dortmund moved to the top of the standings after thrashing Colonia 6-1 at the Signal Iduna Park Stadium. They scored four goals in the first half. Rafael Guerrero kicked off the goal fest for Borussia Dortmund in the 15th minute before Sebastian Aller doubled the score two minutes later from a sleek team move. Marco Reus then curled in Dortmund's third in the 32nd minute as Colonia struggled to handle the home team, with Daniel Marlin smashing in the fourth five minutes later after a fine solo run. Colonia managed to grab a goal three minutes before the interval through Davi Zelke's fierce drive just for Alea to restore a four-goal lead for the hosts nine minutes after the hour mark as he reacted the fastest to a rebound from a free kick that hit the bar. Also recording a brace was Royce as the German international sealed an emphatic 6-1 win for Dortmund 20 minutes from time. 
The victory leaves them one point clear of Bayern Munich, with Der Klassiker Derby between the two arch rivals in two weeks at the start of April. Coming right up after this break, Malaysia may face an uptick in elder poverty. Don't go away. Malaysia is fast becoming an aging nation and this has sparked concerns on whether the country's current social protection infrastructure is adequate to cope with the growing old age population. This is due to fears that more Malaysians may live in poverty once they have reached age 60 and over if their retirement nest is not protected. Hagim Azman reports. Many analysts have raised concerns that the outlook for investment returns going forward is going to be challenging. Therefore, there is a pressing need for reforms to ensure that the people have enough savings to enjoy a comfortable retirement in line with the government's aim to enhance social protection for Malaysians. Currently, many Malaysians rely on the Employees Provident Fund EPF, as their primary source of retirement savings. However, it is widely acknowledged that the contribution rate of most EPF members is too low to ensure they have enough funds in their old age. In addition, the recent special EPF withdrawals granted to contributors have caused their savings to shrink further and further. According to the Malaysian Economic Association, MEA, one potential solution is for the people to have a mandatory retirement savings schemes, social insurance or social security to ensure that they have enough savings to support themselves in their later years. However, this alone would not be enough. The government must also look into three main components in the social protection infrastructure to support its citizens in the long run, namely its labour market policy, social insurance system and social safety nets. 
So the second component is very important for Malaysia going forward because economic crisis can happen, health crisis can happen and it's usually followed by an economic crisis. So when the crisis happen, what will happen to those who have lost their jobs or, or who have fallen sick? Uh, or who, have, who are having spouses who are not able to work. So the social insurance is supposed to kick in when these uh, inc incidents or crises happen. Uh, so making that a, a strong uh, um, system or making every uh, um, working age uh, um, adult, uh, working age adult uh, Malaysian to be part of that system is key going forward. To prevent more Malaysians from falling into the B40 category, Datuk Norma suggested for the government to focus on addressing income inequality, improving access to education and training, and creating more job opportunities. This can provide the people with the skills and knowledge needed to secure higher paying jobs and improve their standards of living. Economists also feel that improving financial literacy among the people can help them make informed decisions to achieve their financial goals and better manage any financial risks. It requires knowledge, especially investment knowledge. Uh, at least one will actually be able to appreciate concepts like uh, compounding factor in investment. So when a person can you know, appreciate the, comp the, 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 the compounding factor concept, then one would be more mindful in terms of how they would actually you know, plan their withdrawal in the future. Because the more withdrawals are being made, uh, then the lesser one will actually receive their returns once, once they retire. Muhammad Afzanizam added that the government, non-governmental organisations and financial institutions play an important role in promoting financial literacy and ensuring the public have access to the information and resources needed for them to make informed financial decisions. With this, the people can take control of their financial future and ensure they have sufficient social protection as they enter retirement. Hakim Azman, TV3. Over in Johor, two people were injured while another four were seriously hurt in a three-vehicle accident involving a tour bus, a tour van and a car on the North-South Expressway near Pagoh on Sunday. A State Fire and Rescue Department spokesperson said a distress call on the incident was received at 5.23pm. The team of firefighters from the Pagoh Fire and Rescue Station were immediately deployed to the scene. The four seriously injured victims, comprising three men and a woman, who were travelling in the van, were pinned inside their vehicle following the crash, while the other two who sustained light injuries were the tour bus driver and a female passenger in the car. All of them were taken to a nearby hospital for treatment. The cause of the accident is still under investigation under the Road Transport Act. Nightline draws to a close this time around, but before we leave, let's take a look at visuals of about 40 people participating in a Ramadan Gotong Royong program at the Surau Al Muhajirin in Bandar Sri Damansara. With that, I'm Anita Wu. Thank you for your company and be well, Malaysia.